Anton Stentner podcast. And today we're talking about beginner investor mistakes. And do we literally have a hundred right There's now? There's a hundred of oh them. Oh my gosh. It's gonna, this is going to be like rapid fire. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go through a lot of information very quickly. And the last five are some of the most important for people to pay attention to. Got it. So do you do you want me to hit you with yeah, each one of these? Yeah, the first right. one. First one is thinking HDTV or Instagram is real life. We all play on social media, okay? We all spend time there. We get those beautiful Instagram photos. We watch HDTV and we think, oh, it's super easy to flip a house. Anyone can buy a rental and it doesn't take money. It happens in 60 seconds too. Yeah, and it happens like boom, overnight, instantly. The reality is, is... Owning investment properties and playing in the real estate game is a lifelong endeavor and it's a pursuit that's going to take time, money, patience, perseverance, and it's extremely rewarding. This is the best game ever invented, but it's not instant. And guess what? Not all of your properties are beautiful and you don't always get the happy ending. Okay, number two, skipping the inspection to save a few bucks. This is a massive, massive mistake. So, I'm a hardcore investor myself. We always pay for a property inspection, even though I understand properties and my partner is a licensed contractor. We'll go through it our, ourselves first. Then we pay the inspector to come by. Why? The inspector is going to go through the checklist. They're going to do structural, pest, mechanical, electrical, whole house. Then they give you a giant punch list of what's happening instead of, oh, you know what? I can save $300, $500. If you're buying an asset that's a quarter million dollars or a million dollars, the price of the inspection is, is just, it's so minuscule. Therefore, always do it. Use it as a punch list. And if the deal is horrible because of the condition of the property, use it to back out. Number three, believing every property will be a cash cow. This one right here is so common. Okay, especially during the Airbnb boom. Everyone you know, they're like, I went and bought a short-term rental. I'm making so much money. Please sign up for my course. That's $99 a month. You know, link below, blah, blah, blah. You too can make $84,000 a month. I get it. There is some people that did that. But when everyone is talking about something and the cash seems easy and it seems too good, you should always buyer beware. And now you're seeing that Airbnb boom turn into the Airbnb bust as these Airbnbs are flushing out, as competition got really high, as the economy changed. COVID is a thing that caused that. I'm just using Airbnb as an example, but you should also be thinking about that with a traditional rental. You should also be thinking that with a midterm. Don't expect massive, massive cash flow. If the deal seems too good, please over scrutinize it and bring it back to reality. Dirty little secret. They only talk about it when times are good, Amen. not when times are bad. Bingo. How many coaching programs for Airbnb are being promoted right now? Not a lot. I, I, I'm not seeing, I'm seeing like zero. Okay. And I'm looking for these things on, on, you know, Instagram, on TikTok, on things like that. If you start seeing the same thing over and over again, everywhere, know that everyone's getting into it and you should be running the other way. Number four, not understanding that owning real estate is owning a business. All good real estate is ran like a business. We've got a profit and loss. We've got a balance sheet. We've got income coming in. We're tracking all the expenses. We have amazing people we're working with. But you also have to treat it like a business. It needs to be separate. It's not your piggy bank to always rob. That's what allows it to grow. And if you don't know how to run a business, figure that out or this will cost you an unbelievable amount of money. Number five, understanding repair costs. Cue dramatic music. Was I supposed to say that? <laughs> the uh, underestimating the repair costs. And though I love it. So you have to say cue dramatic music. The idea is this. Everyone walks into the house and they look and they go, oh, wow, this is only going to cost five grand to fix. And the reality is it costs like 15 or 50, and they massively underestimate repairs, and because they haven't done it, 
especially in flipping, you open up the wall, and this is for a property right over here. It was on 55th. We opened up the wall in the kitchen because we're like, oh, the, the kitchen, you know, it looks like it's leaking a little bit. And the whole back wall is rotted. And we got to replace the whole wall. So what we thought was going to be a $12,000 problem turns into a $32,000 problem. And so with that, if you don't know your number, you got to get someone there to figure out what that number is to protect yourself. Number six, falling for the hot market hype. The hot market hype is very simple. When someone is like, oh, you got to get in on X. You got to get in on this thing. And they're bragging about how much money they're making, how everyone's doing it. And you're seeing it all over Facebook and Instagram and TikTok, just like the Airbnb one. And everyone feels like they're missing out. When the FOMO kicks in, you got to control those emotions and try to avoid that hot market hype. You're looking for a deal, not what everyone else is doing. Yeah, that's actually sometimes the best times when no one else is doing deals. You know, kind of like right now. Interesting. Hey, call, call Anton. <laughs> All his information is down below. Okay, number seven, not crunching the numbers. When we say not crunching the numbers, I want to, there's two parts to this. There's analysis paralysis where the investor gets locked in the numbers too much so they can't make a decision. The second part of this is them not running thorough enough and real enough numbers. Like the insurance number that the agent put in for the fourplex, is that a real insurance number? You need to pick up and call the, your insurance broker and get the real number. You need to look and make sure the property taxes are the real number. And you need to inflate and have repairs, capital expenses, maintenance built into your numbers and actually, if the deal works, then still do it. Everyone excludes taxes, insurance, repairs, utilities, capital expenditures, and vacancy. That's all got to be in there. Number eight, forgetting about property taxes. And so I'm just kind of hitting on this one because this becomes such a big deal. What do you think... What's been crushing people in this really up market as values went and just shot up? What killed their cash flow? New tax like uh, raises. Exactly. I'm getting calls from our investors and they go, my property taxes went up 30, 40 percent. No crap. Value shot up massively. So the property taxes went up to compensate. And then right after that, we got hit with the insurance double whammy. So they're underestimating taxes and they don't estimate that the taxes will go up. If your market is appreciating, no, the assessor is going to charge you more the next month or next year. Number nine, DIYing everything to save money. There's always a difference between when Uncle Bob comes in and does the repair and fixes the door versus the professional fixing the door jam and putting it back together correctly. We like to spend more money and have our properties done at the highest level by the best people because then we know we're going to get less callbacks, less maintenance issues. We're going to be able to have the tenants in there longer before we have to keep repairing it. So our rule is repair it right and repair sooner versus later. What I see a mistake happening is they want to DIY everything and to save money. And so they go and make shoddy repairs. And you see this in roofs all the time or in plumbing or in electrical. Like if you don't know how to do it, don't do it. The second part of this is people make a massive mistake because they forget their day job may pay them more money than the actual repair. So you got a tech worker here in Seattle, they're making 150, 250 grand a year. And they're like, oh, I should go fix this gutter. And they spend 10 hours fixing a gutter. You could just pay someone 350 bucks to go fix the gutter because it's not their skill set. They're not comfortable doing it. it takes more time. They got to buy all the materials. They're going to make five trips to Home Depot. Don't do that. Okay. Don't trade your day job just to save money. Number 10, partnering with a shady investor. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> that, was a, that, was, that was a good dun, dun, dun. What happens when people are really working on getting deals and as they're like trying to build their portfolio, they kind of want to partner with anyone. And what happens is some investor will pop up and say, I'll give you money. 
The second someone says, I'll give you money or I want to do deals with you, you have to seriously start vetting them at an epic level. Is this the right partner? Are our morals and ethics aligned? Are they willing to stay in the same time frame I am? Could I be married to this person? Okay. Are, when do they want their money back? You start asking a massive list of questions. I see people getting into partnerships too early just because they either want capital or experience. Slow down. You didn't just get married overnight. Don't get into business with someone overnight. Number 11, over leveraging yourself. This should go without saying. Everyone only has so much money. If you spread that money in too many directions and you don't have excess cash reserves, when times get tough, you will get pinched and you will lose your property or your properties. You have to have excess cash. You cannot over leverage yourself. You need to prepare for good times and bad. The mistake is we always believe the good times will be here. And that it's going to keep going up forever. And that it will keep going up forever and the good times will always continue. Number 12, underestimating how long it takes to find tenants. Most performers include a 5% vacancy rate. 5% of 30 days is what? Five times three, 15, two days. You're telling me your property is going to be vacant for two days? No way. Even if they moved out on the Friday and you had Saturday and Sunday to work on it, it almost never gets turned in two days. So I think you need to be reasonable in including a vacancy factor that's at like 10% or sometimes more. You also need to be paying attention to what direction the vacancy factor is changing in your area. Where is it going? Number 13, not knowing your local rental laws. So this is a massive rookie move. Massive rookie move, huge mistake. People just buy properties and they don't go and do the due diligence to figure out, is this a landlord tenant friendly state, city or county? What's an eviction like here? Who are they going to side with? Talk to other landlords, talk to attorneys that do real estate law, learn the pitfalls, learn the mistakes, learn it all. We've been talking about things like this a lot for a long time with a lot of our investors. All of you listeners, you're, you're hearing these things. Washington State, for example, we are becoming a unfriendly environment. I'm still going to stay here. I love it here. But know that like my properties in Kentucky, that's a much more landlord-friendly, pro-landlord environment. Number 14, buying a fixer-upper without a plan. When we fail to plan, we're failing right from the start. And so everyone says, I want sweat equity. I want to go make some money. I want to fix this thing up. But then they don't go build the budget, figure out where the cash is coming from, what are the contractors, subcontractors are themselves going to do it, and then what's the timeline to get it done in. What they do is they buy something, and then they go in and wing it. And by winging it, they don't get it done efficiently. And when we buy real estate, time is money, and money's just burning while we're waiting. Number 15, trusting Zestimate values like gospel. Your Zestimate there on Zillow is not guaranteed. The Redfin evaluation is not guaranteed. All of these valuation models are a computer looking around, pulling in some data points and going, here's what's happening. They cannot account for the nuances in the market. So you yourself have to study the market and if you're not a real estate professional, you have to have, find a trusted real estate advisor who understands investing, who's going to give you an honest opinion about pricing and the market, because no computer's ever going to be able to tell you the facts. They, they just can't know everything. Number 16, listening to that friend who knows real estate or doesn't know and is trying to discourage you. We've all had this. You've got the know-it-all in the family. And they're like, oh, you just buy in this city and you do this and this is what happens. And they're broke. And they're broke. Or they say, Benji, never do that. Never do that. If you buy a duplex, you'll go broke and you'll die of starvation. You're like, what's starvation got to do with buying a duplex? Their fear, they're pushing off onto you. So always be weary when someone starts giving you advice, but be very attentive and listening when that person owns 10 properties, 20 properties, when they have a track record of success, then pay attention. 
If their track record doesn't justify it, ignore them. Number 17, ignoring the home's history, ghosts and all. Why don't people do research on properties? If it says 123 Main Street, drop 123 Main Street into Google and figure out what the general public would know about 123 Main Street. If it says this house is haunted in 1852, this horrible thing happened and there are ghosts here or whatever other dramatic or horrible thing, do you think it's going to be a good rental? Maybe not. Do you think it's going to hurt your resale value? Could. Do the due diligence to figure out what the history of the property is and go knock on the neighbor's door. Hey, I'm looking at 123 Main Street right there. What do you think about that property? And listen to what they say. Number 18, overlooking hidden costs. Hidden costs can be so sneaky because they'll pop up when we're not thinking about it. The most common is insurance and then maintenance. If, if you're not going to do anything, assume one month's rent is going to be lost every year to maintenance no matter what, or 1% of the value of the home. Factor that in. Then have that set off to the side in that bank account that has your six months worth of reserves and your 1% in maintenance. That will always protect you. So six months worth of the payment, 1% of the purchase price for maintenance. Then if anything pops up, I'm protected and I don't get attacked by the sneaky hidden cost. Number 19, relying on verbal agreements. If it's not in writing, it does not exist in real estate, period. End of discussion. Contract law says in writing. If it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. This includes when you're buying the property. This includes if you're doing an option agreement, a lease option, a first right of refusal, a lease agreement, whatever it may be. Put everything in writing. Otherwise, this will cost you thousands and tens and thousands of dollars. Number 20, buying emotionally. Because real estate is a large purchase. And we're all being swayed by social media. What happens is people get really excited and they just buy purely based on emotion. This is a business. This is not a romance. Do the numbers make sense? Is this in an area that I feel comfortable and safe in? Would I bring my kids here? Is this tenant gonna stay long-term? Is this property easy to maintain? If all that's good, great. Don't just buy it because you love the carpet, you love the area, you love something. As you start to feel those feelings of euphoria and, the, and your shit-eating grin gets too big, calm those emotions down and go to the numbers. Number 21, being inflexible with your offer. A negotiation is an art. You have to be willing to dance. You have to be willing to ask questions. You have to be able to willing to do deals differently. If you can craft your deal as the buyer towards the seller, you're going to be able to get the best deal. Co go into a negotiation with a very open mind and have plans A, B, and C prepared. Number 22, skipping the walkthrough before closing. <laughs> this one's personally bit me. This has cost me money. Um, okay, right before closing, you should just walk right back through the property. Take a look at it. Make sure it looks the way it's supposed to look. No one's living in a closet. No one's living in a closet. We don't got squatters. They didn't pick up the washer. This is exactly what happened. They didn't pick up the washer and dryer and leave a three-foot gouge in the hard woods as they drug it across the floor. And the property had already closed. They said it was there beforehand. We didn't have any pictures. $3,000 mistake, dead serious. Go through the property right before just to confirm everything. Number 23, not building a solid team. Okay, your job is to assemble the Avengers. You need the absolute professionals. That includes number one, your real estate agent as your trusted advisor. You can reach us at rsg.com. Your lender who can help you work through the numbers, your contractor who can help you figure out the numbers, the property manager to figure out the rent, your title person, your escrow person, your surveyor, whatever it may be, you've got to assemble a team. Running a business in real estate requires the team of outside professionals in order to get the best returns. Number 24, forgetting about HOA fees. HOA fees will bite you. Okay, I don't like buying condos. Why? I'm so out of the loop and out of the control of the management of the HOA, they can raise the fees at any time and hurt me. 
but also realize even small HO fee, HOA fees could jump dramatically. So if the HOA fee says $50 a month, you're like, oh, that's okay. What if it was 250 What if it was 100 Would that break this deal? So you need to go look at that and run it at a higher number to see if it's still going to work because HOA fees always go up. They never go down. Side story, my first house I ever owned, there was HOA fees and they decided to rebuild the fence around the whole perimeter of the neighborhood, Parkview Estates. And I was charged 250 bucks for my portion or whatever. I didn't know. So they put a lien on my house. Oh my goodness. And I didn't know it because I didn't pay attention to HOA yes. stuff. I, it was, I was only 18. No excuse, but that's a true story. But prime example, follow the HOA. What are they doing? Monitor those people. Number 25, not planning for vacancies. Okay. We kind of already mentioned vacancies, but most performers plan for a 5%. I believe there's going to be a 10% or a 15%. And also you need to be aware of where you're at in the economy. If the economy is growing, vacancy goes down. If the economy is shrinking, vacancy goes up. So when times are getting tough, know that your vacancy factor increases and save your cash accordingly. Number 26, over-improving for the neighborhood. Okay, this one literally just pisses me off because I've had to explain this one a thousand times. It's always emotion. They walk into the house and they say, oh, I have to change this. I have to change that. I got to put in this countertop. I got to put in this backsplash. What they're doing is they're making the property how they want to live there. When they got to pull back and they got to go, what is the neighborhood support and what's going to get me my highest return and the best tenant that'll stay the longest. If the best tenant stays because of quartz countertops and a tile backsplash, great, put it in. If the best tenant stays with Formica, save your money. Don't improve it because emotionally you feel good and because you've been staring at pictures on freaking Instagram over and over again, and magically you want to paint every house black now, okay? Not 99% of houses don't look good black. And when they're painted black, they're super dark inside. However, when you look at a gigantic 5,000 square foot house on Instagram with beautiful setting and lighting, you go, that is the most beautiful color I've ever seen. I want to do that. It doesn't look as good in a 1,500 foot Rambler. So you're saying Formica is not fancy? I'm saying for my cause not fancy. And I'm saying do what's affordable, bro. Like do what the neighborhood needs, what creates the best quality tenant that's going to stay the longest. That tenant doesn't necessarily need, like on one of them, for example, they're like, well, what do you think I should do to the landscaping? I was like, you should put in really hardy landscaping and make sure it looks good and maybe one flowering thing in the front. And I come back and I look at it and they spent like 10 grand in landscaping. And I go, What'd you do? Well, it just wasn't pretty enough. Is pretty going to get you more rent now that you've exceeded the expectation for the neighborhood? No. Build to the expectation of the neighborhood and what's going to get you the best quality tenant. Number 27, ignoring the resale potential. Oh, yeah, man. Like, just because you can get a really good buy on something, you have to think about what is it going to sell for in the future? Is it going to appreciate? What's it going to look like in five years? What direction is that neighborhood trending? So I'm selling an asset in Kentucky right now. And the reason we're selling that asset is because the future potential of that area is great. But the appreciation for the next 24 months to 36 months looks like it's going to suck. So we're selling the asset and bringing the asset or the cash home to Seattle where we're going to get higher returns. That's what I mean. Where's the future? What's the potential? Don't always be stuck because it's just a good deal. Number 28, believing you'll get rich quick. Real estate, this game is simple. We buy real estate and we wait. This is not a get rich quick scheme. This is a get rich slow scheme. Every decade, you'll look like a genius. Just have the patience to wait decades. Buy and wait. It's easy. There are properties that I have purchased, that I still own, that have almost tripled in value in less than 20 years. That's unbelievable. Makes me look smart. Makes me look like an awesome investor. 
Time and compound interest make you smart. That's the beauty of real estate. Number 29, not having an exit strategy. I think when we go to have our exit strategy, we need to have plan A, B, C, and D. Because not all plans survive first contact. Not all plans work. And we, you have to be willing and able to pivot on the fly, depending on the economy, depending on the, your financial situation, and depending on whether or not you got a better deal on the other side. So we always write out four strategies. And if those four strategies make sense, then great. Now I have multiple exit strategies. Going in with only one is planning to fail again. Number 30, ignoring the insurance fine print. Oh, this is a really big one. Insurance fine print. What type of a policy are you getting? What does it actually cover? Does it cover theft? Does it cover wind damage? Does it cover if the tenant burned it down? And to what level? Uh, another mistake we've seen that's really huge is as the market's rapidly appreciated, people haven't naturally increased their policies enough to keep up with the replacement value. So read the fine print and know what you have covered. Number 31, buying in a flood zone. Okay. So we live in the Evergreen State, north end of the Seattle Metro. It's called the Evergreen State for a reason. It rains a lot here. So wherever you're purchasing, I want you to do one simple thing. You go to FEMA, you pull the floodplain maps, and you look at the 100-year floodplain map. And if your property is inside the 100-year floodplain, then you need to understand what is the base flood elevation. In other words, how high does the water go in a 100-year flood? Because one will happen in your lifetime. And if the base flood elevation is 18 feet and the property is 12 feet tall, it's going to go underwater. And know that's going to become a problem at some point. We've seen major flood damage in our area. We generally don't buy unless it's a beautiful, cute little cabin or something near a river. And we just know we're making a risk. Number 32, skipping the title search. Okay. The reason the lender always forces a title search. So even if you're paying cash, spend the money on the title search. This is cheap protection. It will make sure you're actually buying it from the seller. You have all the protections put in place and all the liens are getting cleared. I don't understand why anyone would ever want to skip this, but I've had people try to skip this. Cost. It's cost, but like it's such a small $900 to $2,200. Like this is cheap when you're buying a $300,000 asset. Don't 900 versus 90,000. Bingo. Yeah. What if you found a $90,000 lien? That's a huge problem. And there are liens. Okay, uh, number 33, not understanding the mortgage terms. In the Great Recession, the great financial crisis, the big short, we did an unbelievable amount of work for banks, builder-developer bailouts, and short sales. Very, very often, I would get, well, I didn't know that. Just because you think your mortgage says something doesn't mean the mortgage specifically says that. Go read the fine print, understand if it can reset, if it's fixed, understand the amortization length and when it's going to get called due. And if there are other hidden fees like a balloon payment coming or a prepayment penalty. These are massive problems in projects. We had a townhome project over here for one of our investors, a little six unit, beautiful townhomes. We have it sold and he goes to the bank and the bank says there is a prepayment penalty. And the prepayment penalty, because this is a multi-million dollar property, is $79,000. He goes, I can't do that. I, I can't spend 80 grand. Now he's got himself stuck in a situation where the buyer could sue him. And so he actually had to give the buyer and the buyer's agent money to make them go away. Now, luckily, they didn't sue him. We we're, we're very good at talking and helping navigate that situation. But that really backed us into a corner for not understanding the mortgage terms. Bonus question. Is it good to have a mortgage lender or broker that has experience to help avoid this? 1,000%. And your job is to know what they are and bring it with you to the closing table and review at the closing table what the terms are supposed to be before you signed the note that goes against the property. Because I've gotten to the closing table 
and the terms have been different because somebody fat-fingered something or accidentally included a prepayment penalty, and I've had to send this back. And I'm not, this has happened more than five times. So this is not like unbelievably, because we're humans, we type things. And so things get done wrong. Review the documents, closing table, best way to protect yourself. Number 34, betting on gentrification without backup. Gentrification is where the neighborhood's massively improving. So you're making a future bet that things are, the neighborhood's going to continue improving. Don't make a future bet unless you have proof that it's happening. I'll add to this. People also make future bets that the zoning's going to change. Don't do that unless it's sitting in the comprehensive plan or part of their long-term vision. If it's not there, it's probably not going to happen. If the deal works today, great. And the other stuff is just an upside, but don't bet on things that aren't there. Number 35, falling for guaranteed rental income (laughs) promises. This is so unbelievable. So the investor will look at the pro forma and they'll say, oh, this is a can't lose situation. No pro forma survives first contact, and they always end up slightly different than what was putting out there. So if something's guaranteed, sounds too good to be true, discount the pro forma, discount the performance, and if it still works, great. Then if you hit the pro forma numbers, you smash it out of the park, but always go conservative. Number 36, letting your ego drive the investment. The... I am guilty of this. And so like, I almost feel embarrassed of this, but this is like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in, I'm in real estate church right now. I'm in confessional. You're my priest. There was a property in, and I've done this more than this, but this is the one that sticks out in my head the most. There was a property in late 2006, right before the market crashed. And I bought it with a zero down investor loan at 7% uh, interest, which doesn't sound bad today, but it was bad that day. I wrapped in all the closing costs, so I had negative equity the second I purchased it. I should have never purchased that property. It was all ego. I let my ego get in the way of just hunting for a better deal. Don't make my mistake. Number 37, failing to network with other investors. If you go to other investors, they know something. Go learn from their wisdom. It'll speed up your process. It'll speed up your returns. You should be going to investor meetups. We hold investor meetups. All of you that are local are welcome to attend them. And we we have like-minded people. It also gets you excited. Talks about today's current issues. Talks about the pitfalls. Gets you excited and allows um, the wisdom to be passed on. Bonus tip. Always buy investors their lunch. And take them out to lunch often because they have to eat and they feel flattered that you're buying them lunch. I've done that lately for almost two decades. Yeah, great way to network and connect with people. Number 38, trusting photos without seeing it in person. I don't think you should ever buy a property sight unseen. Um, You may put under contract photos, video tour, things like that. But I don't feel comfortable spending my money or investors' money purchasing something that we haven't physically walked through, touched, and seen. That's part of this game, too. You just kind of have to accept that. Otherwise, what will happen is someone will send you marketing photos, and in the marketing photo, they'll ignore the toxic waste dump in the backyard. They'll ignore the overhead power lines. They'll ignore the fact that the neighbor's a hoarder, and you'll end up with something costing you a lot of money. Number 39, overlooking environmental hazards. So... I would say this one pops up more in commercial or land development or things like that. There is what's called a phase one and a phase two environmental report. They literally dig into the ground. They pull the soil out of the ground and they go, what's happened here? And they go back through history. I owned a property that was an office building and the office building at once, uh, 30 years before that, was actually a gas station. That gas station had a leak. It had a over a million dollar cleanup on site to fix that leak. I bought it post cleanup, okay? But the person in front of me almost had to pay for it. Luckily, it was found out the original gas station was at uh, at fault and that happened to be a major corporation, so they were still in business. Otherwise, the owner in front of me would have had to have paid that million dollar cleanup out of their pocket. Number 40, not accounting for seasonal fluctuations. Massive, massive mistake. Okay, let's go through buyer psychology. Buyer psychology and tenant psychology is the same thing. 
a property is easiest to rent and rents for the most money early spring to early fall. When it's raining outside and it's cold outside and the snow is falling, it's the hardest to rent, it takes the longest to rent, and the tenants want to pay the least. So try to have your properties pop up in the spring through the fall. Also, realize your best deals also happen in the off season for your purchasing. Number 41, underestimating ongoing maintenance costs. Like I said, I think you should automatically include 1% of the purchase price as ongoing maintenance costs. What I see is people don't pump money into their properties. We budget that in and we automatically pump money into our properties. So then I don't get hit with a massive bill that costs two to three times as much. You, you as a landlord and a business owner want to spend money to protect your asset, to increase the value, to get the better tenant. You should be spending money on your property as a privilege, not an obligation. Therefore, you won't get hit with a huge bill all at once. Number 42, buying in a declining market. So nobody has a crystal ball, right? But you should be able to look to see population trends, economic trends, job trends. What's the median income? What's the number of houses being built there? If everything's going the wrong way, don't buy there. Run, go buy in a better area. Bonus question, when is it good to buy in a declining market? Ooh, that's a phenomenal question. The best time to buy in a declining market is when there's a major change happening. For example, Boeing is coming into your backyard. Ford is coming into your backyard. And they're coming into a cheaper market. And they're going to be a major employer that's going to employ 10% of the area. That's opportunity because they're going to start to fundamentally change that. You have to think about this. If someone with that much money, Amazon's coming into the area, they believe in the area and they're making a bet. By them making a bet, they got more money than Benji and Anton. Just follow the big boys. If Walmart's going to build somewhere, buy everything around there. <laughs> bingo, bingo, bingo. Number 43, ignoring the appraisal value. So the appraisal is an opinion of value, but I've seen investors get an appraisal back where we have the property under contract for 550 grand and it comes back at 500 and they go, it's okay. No, it's not. You just lost 50 grand. Okay. Generally speaking, unless the appraisal was done incorrectly, which happens, you don't want to buy something under market value and have negative equity. That was mistakes already made for all of you <laughs> pre-Great Recession. Don't make those mistakes. Subscribe for more so I can help you avoid those mistakes. Don't do that. Number 44, investing too far from the home base. Yeah, I think as you're getting started, try to have everything within 30 minutes of your home because then you know or have a network that can help you find plumbers, electricians, you know, lenders, things like that. Also, as it gets too far, you don't want to drive there. You don't want to go look at it. You don't want to go figure out the problems. I like to drive by my properties. I drive by. I touch them. You know, I even tell my kids, oh, there's a college fund for you. There's a college fund for you. I was joking with one of the ones the other day. I was like, that used to be your college fund, then we sold it. So I don't know what's happening now. <laughs> um, but the idea is like, if you see it, you know its condition. You know how the tenant is treating it. And if it's close, you'll take better care of it. And lastly, you know the market probably the best oh, yeah. compared to anywhere else. It's Brilliant. tempting to buy in Arizona or New York or wherever you heard this insider information. Yep. But you know the most insider information on your local market. Number 45, not researching a builder or developer's track record. Yeah, so if you're going to go buy new construction and or you're buying a plot of land, Go do some research to figure out who you're buying it from. I have had investors. And so, so I always get called with these things. That's the point. I, not only do I make mistakes, I solve other people's mistakes. So I get called and they say, oh, matter of fact, the one I was working on today, we have this 15-unit townhome project. How do we fix it? And I look at it and go, and I ran the numbers. Okay, so this was a ton of research. We did a whole pro forma on it for them. This should have never been a townhome project. If you build it today, they're going to physically be upside down. Like you can't build it and make money. And that's just a massive mistake that I don't want our listeners to make. 
like do research on the builder, do research on the developer, understand what you're purchasing ahead of time and their track record because that matters. Number 46, relying solely on online listings for leads. Okay, we've talked about this many times. Only like 20% of what we buy comes out of the MLS. That means if you're only looking in the MLS, you're missing 80% of the market. And that means you're gonna miss out on some of the best deals or maybe the best deal for you. And especially like here in our Seattle Metro, inventory is low, so everything's a bidding war. So most of what I'm buying right now, unless it's something that needs fixing, is really off market because we can't get a good enough deal otherwise. Number 47, overlooking the importance of curb appeal. If you pull up and you go, this looks like the hood. I don't feel comfortable. Oh, there's someone passed out in the lawn next to it. Oh, there goes a tweaker pushing a grocery cart and the grass is burnt and all the bushes are dead. Do you think the tenant's going to feel warm and fuzzy? No. No. Grass is burnt is definitely a clear sign. Yeah. You want them to feel warm and fuzzy. So the, your properties do need curb, a curb appeal because you can attract a better quality tenant that stays longer. So we like to, our rentals, generally speaking, are B class and A class properties. We don't really own C and they're all in good neighborhoods and they're larger properties and our tenants seem to stay longer and they're all in phenomenal condition and we keep them that way. So they got great curb appeal. Number 48, buying too many properties too fast. You will run out of cash. It's a fact. If you're gonna be a hardcore investor, you're gonna run out of cash. You don't need to go buy 10 properties in a month, in a year, maybe even in two years. Can you? Yes. But every time you buy another property, what our listeners need to understand is that you've now created another business with a whole set of people, books, and problems attached to it. So what we like to do is we like to buy one, get our sea legs underneath us, get it performing, then purchase the next one, even if we got a phenomenal deal. Wait, get it performing, then buy. Make sure you're comfortable. Number 49, not having a buy box. When you ask an investor, what's a deal? And they say, just bring me a deal, or this is a deal. And they can't clearly define the metrics by which they purchase. You're not an investor. You're a hobbyist. You're lying to yourself. Go get the exact metrics. So then I can cut the emotion out of it. I can literally run the numbers and be like, this is what I buy. Or I can say, no, I don't buy this. I was just asked also right before this, hey, uh, would you do a $20,000 non-refundable earnest money uh, at the end of a, the feasibility on this one in this particular city? And I said, no, absolutely not. I won't. I said, I'll give you two grand. Otherwise, kill the deal. And they said, well, why? I said, I don't trust that city further than I can throw them. I'm not going to throw 20 grand at you. I said, let me know. And I literally just walked away from the deal because I know my buy box. It's so clear. And I also know how that particular municipality performs. And I'm not willing to take that risk. Buy box gives you a line in the sand. Bingo. You don't cross it. Non-emotional. Number 50, believing every flip will turn a profit. Okay. I love flipping. I love new construction. I love land development. With all three of those, you have to understand that sooner or later you will lose and it will cost you money. With all of those items, it's not if, it's a function of when. So you must be prepared emotionally, physically, financially, and your relationship prepared to lose money. That conversation I was having earlier today, the um, with that townhome project, those people are going to lose money. And so now they have to turn around as a partnership and decide how much am I willing to lose and what do I need to do and how do I get out of this? I'm not saying it happens all the time, but it definitely happens. So you must be prepared for it. Boom. Hey, if you guys got value out of those first 50 mistakes that beginner investors should avoid, hit that like button. And if you want to hear the second part, subscribe to Anton's channel. How do people get a hold of you? Uh, you can reach us at uh, rsg.com and our phone number is in the comments.